Hey everybody, I'm Gilad. Uh, I write about tech, tech policy, and the, and the politics of the tech industry. Uh, and um, that's about all I have to say about myself. So now I'd like the <laughs> panel to, uh, I'm just the moderator here. So uh, maybe everybody could go around and, and say a couple words about themselves and their background. Yeah, uh, I am Alex Stamos. Uh, I was a longtime cybersecurity practitioner and uh, then was the chief security officer at Yahoo and Facebook, which is where I got exposed to the trust and safety issues we'll be talking about today. I'm now the director of the Stanford Internet Observatory, uh, where I teach a trust and safety class and uh, have two of our former students here, actually. Um, so, uh, and uh, we're Stanford Internet Observatory. We work on these kinds of issues uh, from a, a technical and a policy perspective. Uh, my name is Renee Duresta. I'm the technical research manager at Stanford Internet Observatory. Um, prior to that, I had a couple different um, jobs in, uh, in tech as a startup co-founder uh, in venture capital. I was a trader on Wall Street for a while. And um, I got into this topic um, largely by just paying attention to the dynamics of how information moved on the internet. I was a mom and I was really struck by like recommendation engines and what they were pushing to me as I had my first baby. And I thought like, there's some really crazy shit that's, uh, <laughs> that's going on here. Um, and I got very interested in understanding like network dynamics and information flows. And that kind of took me into the career I have today. Renee and I are the deep state mandarins yes. or whatever we've been called <laughs> on the alt right. So let's hear it for team deep state. Come on guys. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I'm Alex Fierst. Uh, I uh, was the uh, head of legal at Medium for nearly five years, and that's what got me into trust and safety uh, work, and I spun up the trust and safety function there. People used to say, but there's no Nazis on Medium, and the answer is like, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was general counsel then of a company called Neuralink, and most recently um, uh, co-founded a thing called the Digital Trust and Safety Partnership, which is a uh, industry-led attempt to uh, have self-governance on best practices for trust and safety, content moderation, things like that. And I have a company called Murmuration Labs, which helps companies, uh, large tech companies, Web3 uh, projects and others try to uh, figure out their, their trust and safety best practices and uh, software and policy. Antonio Garcia Martinez, um, been in a bunch of tech companies, uh, early Facebook. Uh, if you ever browse the internet and then see something about that in your Instagram feed, I, I'm the one to blame for that, at least the early versions of that at Facebook, on um, the early ads team. I wrote a memoir about it called Chaos Monkeys that came out in 2016 that made a bit of a stir. Um, I wrote for Wired for a while, actually. Um, so did I. Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> at the same time, in fact. Look, a lot of us wrote for Wired. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, now I'm a senior fellow at the Lincoln Network. Um, so. Antonio loves targeted ads. Um, <laughs> not really what we're going to be talking about today, though. Um, so I thought just to start, I've always been struck that different people have just completely and often conflicting notions of what the problem is when it comes to online expression and um, content moderation, or some people say censorship. So just to orient the discussion so that the audience kind of knows where we're coming from, I was wondering if, if it's possible to, to boil it down, if everybody could just go around and say what they think of as like the main issue right now when it comes to online expression maybe in the same order that we started. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the main issue is that people are horrible, right? Like if you, if you work in any kind of trust and safety space, you realize that there are a bunch of like deep-seated horrible pathologies that have existed possibly for hundreds of years, but in the internet context, when you divorce people from sometimes their, their real life identity, you allow them to interact over hundreds or thousands of miles, when you give them a situation which they feel that they, what they do has very little weight and impact, they become much worse. Mm -hmm. um, and so the truth is, is like every time we give, the internet's this wonderful thing that gives individual people the kinds of communication powers that used to be reserved for commercial, you know, governments and huge corporations. And that's incredible and has a lot of benefits. But the flip side is, is that unleashes a huge amount of really negative things too. And, um, we don't really have a good framework for how to deal with that because all of these frameworks around free expression, political expression, free speech, 
whatever you want to call it, come from like these 18th and 19th century ideas of what speech is like, and none of the societal expectations have caught up with the reality of, what, of what's going on. Right, no one ever had to know what everybody else thought about Queen Elizabeth dying. Just would never have happened. I would right. never have had to know what you thought about it. Right, right, I didn't have to listen to like every, every associate professor who's trying to get like Twitter clout, yeah. like have their opinion, <laughs> right? And then like it becomes like the main character of the day and everybody has to get super angry about it. That's exactly, I mean that's the kind of stuff that like people used to be like have breadboards and screen on the corner and you could just ignore them which we still have in San Francisco um, and uh, but now like you give that person a Twitter account and they have the possibility of inserting themselves and like actually changing the conversation and it's almost never for the better like it's hard to think of like a viral tweet where I'm like man that person really kind of elucidated this problem in a way that created a lot of really intelligent conversation no that's not it's like this person threw a huge grenade into the national psyche um, and then there's all kinds of, and we'll get to it. There's all kinds of like really, really, really horrible stuff too. I mean, we're going to be talking about politics here. I should, but there's like it, it gets really dark. I should say when I, when I, when I said that people will get can give conflicting uh, or opposed answers to this question, what I had in mind was that like to oversimplify, a lot of people think that the basic problem is there's too much bad shit on the internet, and then a, a lot of other people think that there's too much removal or suppression of content on the internet, and these two impulses are kind of opposed. Um, and so that's kind of what I was getting at. And so Alex is getting at like the, the first part. I'm just going to play the role you gave me, man. I didn't, I don't even, <laughs> I barely know who you guys are. Um, <laughs> Renee. I would say, um, you know, look, there's these moments in human history. There's like the emergence of a new technology creates a societal upheaval. There was the printing press, there was radio, there was television. Uh, and in all of those environments, it was primarily a broadcast medium, kind of um, one to many. And then the internet gave us many to many. And I think that as a result, what you start to have is, um, information reaching people in very personalized ways. The idea of the main character of Twitter where a mob of angry people can suddenly find you and your experience of like, I just presented my speech and then the response is this, this kind of like um, screaming horde of angry people is a very interesting, I think, distinctly different dynamic um, than we had in, in speech environments past. And I think that's actually one of the reasons why when we get at the, um, the societal conversation about whether to take more up or leave more down, is that people experience speech in a very different way today uh, than they did in the past. And that, I think, is, is a, you know, the, the kind of foundational change of infrastructure is um, at the root of the, the dynamic. Alex, too? So I would norm, I'm, I'm subbing in for Mike Solana tonight, so I would normally be sitting over there. But I'm gonna try to channel, <laughs> channel some. Where is Mike? Has anybody <laughs> seen Mike? Is he okay? Mike, are you okay? Call us, man. And so I think, I think we can all agree on people are horrible. I, I um, <laughs> like my feeling on this is like hell is other people's expression. Yeah. Um, and, that, and that the internet is. Except ours. The internet is other people's <laughs> expression. No, I mean, it, it's, you know, we're, yes, we are special. Um, <laughs> But, uh, and, and a couple of, the, to pick up on a couple of the things that were said, like I think social media and internet allows one to sort of selectively repeal some of the laws of nature, like ephemerality and um, reach and other things that allow you to tinker with the physics that normally constrain speech in everyday life and allow them to have impact or allow them to have idiosyncratic effects that they wouldn't have based on older technologies. And so we are contending with having issued, you know, a billion printing presses slash porn studios to everybody and distribution tools for them. I think the second point is like, as, as Alex said, like a lot of the doctrinal and sort of um, cliches that we met, have for thinking about speech were not just came out of like an enlightenment moment of philosophy, but also the technological assumptions, such as like, remember like the cure for bad speech is more speech? Like, the, like that's when the marginal cost of speech is a certain amount. But if you bring the marginal cost down, some, maybe at some point the cure to bad speech is not more speech because you can create so much bad speech for such little money that some of these assumptions have actually changed based on very material things like the cost of printing presses and the cost of other um, ways of interacting. But I do want to say one or two things for the other side. <laughs> and one of them is that I think there's sort of a, the, the other forces in American life and global life are interrelated to this stuff. It's not just about speech and about internet. And one of them is sort of a general sense of paternalism and safety. Um, as, as like sort of an 80s Gen Xer kid who played with rusty nails growing up, like the assumption that life is safe or that the internet can and should be safe. Like there is a certain amount of safety that one can expect and seatbelts are generally good. And I sometimes point out that the number of decades between the invention of the car and the, man the mandating of the seatbelt was sort of like 50 years. Um, the, the assumptions that we bring about how safe something should be, especially when it's a vehicle of thought, are probably 
different now in American life than they've been in the past. And that's something to sort of keep an eye on because th there's certainly a, a responsibility of companies to do all sorts of things, but the level of safety that one expects when they send their kid to like, you know, 19 types of Kung Fu lessons or whatever is not what it, what it used to be. And I think it's important to see that creeping paternalism. Um, an another aspect of this finally is like the larger sort of corporate capitalism context, which is that companies and most um, providers of these internet services are private, you know, are, are Del lean and mean Delaware C Corps. They have a mandate to maximize profit and do other things under sort of like Delaware law and federal law. But when people say in, in trust and safety land, like you have a responsibility to like protect users, protect non-users, protect the public. And then even as the concentric rings move out, like protect abstractions like democracy, protect our institutions. And if you're a board member or a lawyer for a company or a person who works for a company, you're like, where, where does my responsibility to uphold um, democratic institutions, how does it get like operationalized in my responsibility to steer this company? I'm, I ain't again it, like I'm for not undermining democracy, but when I have a responsibility <laughs> to do X, Y, and Z for my shareholders, I don't know how to make ethical choices in this framework that we have of like Delaware law to do stuff that's not supposed to undermine democracy when I do the predictable things I'm supposed to do for my stakeholders. So we just are operating under this system that has a particular set of incentives that don't jibe with the moral intuitions that I think a lot of folks have now. I really want to come back to that exact point, but first let's hear from Antonio. Okay, this is supposed to be a debate, so I have to disagree with somebody on that, on that side of the... <laughs> so I, I, I disagree with what both of you said, which is that the internet is fundamentally different than sort of media challenges we faced in the past. You cited the example of the printing press, Renee, which is a very good one. I think the closer you look at the printing press example, the more like the internet it becomes. Uh, we often think of Gutenberg's invention printing, uh, you know, the Bible and beautiful ruminations on philosophy. That's not actually what they mostly printed. They printed what the Germans call the Flugschrift and flying words, which were these little pamphlets that looked like Facebook posts that would make fun of the Pope, and that wouldn't pass Facebook's content policy today, right? Uh, in fact, in Martin Luther's memoirs, he said when he went to Diet of Worms, the news of him getting there moved faster than himself getting there. So already information was moving faster than a man could move on horseback, and this is in the 16th century. Um, if you were to ask the question, for example, a resurrected Ben Franklin, would he be working at Condé Nast and Wired and The New Yorker and The New York Times and writing fact check journalism? Or would he be in a non-account ship poster with 20 accounts, right? And a viral substack and some bizarre name and like a picture of a saint or something. And only, I, only <laughs> I, I, I suspect he would be the latter. He would not be the former, right? And so I, I don't know that, that the internet presents, there are some unique challenges there, obviously, technically, but I do think the frameworks and the way that we thought about it, right? The, the Brandenburg v. Ohio standard of imminent lawless action, i.e. you're actually saying, I'm gonna go kill somebody right now, is a pretty good measure to hold to. Um, I'm actually not a free speech absolutist. And, you know, I don't think doxing is a good thing. Obviously, kitty point is not a good thing. All those things should be filtered and pursued. Like, I'm, I'm not in the absolute sort of case, but I, I do think the standard of what is violence and what is protection, to your point about safety, is a very good one. And I think, you know, freedom of speech is the freedom to say and think stupid shit. And to think that we can epistemologically or even technically go in and establish capital T truth at scale is impossible. The AI isn't there. And just, I mean, just today, the BIU story with New York Times in which they claimed this racist incident happened, the school looks into it, it was totally fake. It was absolutely, literally fake news, right? So what, are we gonna, are we gonna go and do our own fact check reportage? Are we gonna pull down every mention and comment of it? It's just not gonna happen, right? Well, let's, let's stick on that. Um on that example, um, so just it, for those of you who haven't been following, I guess there was a story about a, a, a volleyball game that took place at BYU in which one of the black players on the visiting team was uh, said that a fan had been shouting racist abuse at her, and then her, I think her mother elaborated on that, uh, and it became a big story, and then a lot of follow-up uh, reporting and investigation suggests that it probably didn't happen, like maybe she misheard something and then it kind of took on a life of its own. Um, the interesting thing about that, Antonio, and it, and it actually ties into what Alex was saying, is that when, the, when, when a newspaper gets something like that wrong, we can all say the newspaper failed here. We can judge it by the standards that the journalism profession has established for itself. So we screw up all the time but there is a, a, a really, there's a pretty rich set of institutional and professional norms that developed over a long period of time, especially in the early part of the 20th century, that at least allow us to, that provide a metric. And it's funny, people think that um, 
you know, the, that like the news industry is all like the newspaper in Spider-Man where he's just trying to go for the most sensational stuff. But actually, if you pick up a copy of major newspapers, they've got these boring stories on the front page that nobody actually wants to read. It's not there because they make money from that. Uh, it's there because the people who work there believe that there's something, that they have to do something important. And even if they're uh, incorporated in Delaware, and it just, when, <laughs> so to bring it back to what you were saying, Alex, I've been thinking about this for a long time, of this question of how do, how do you get the likes of, you know, Twitter, or Facebook, whatever, to develop their own version of the professional norms that, that lead the journalism industry to sometimes not do the thing that would be the most profitable? Well, if I, if I could push back for a second on this one, and I dealt with this a lot at Medium, we were both a UGC platform, and commissioning journalism. An interesting thing about the level of transparency that we have now is that when you take something down off of a Twitter or off of a Facebook, everybody knows about it and there's a demand for a great deal of transparency into the decision making. Whereas when the New York Times spikes Harvey Weinstein stories every day of the week based on letters from David Boies, nobody hears about it because the threshold is, not, is that it has not been taken down. But it got, it got, it got strangled in the crib. And things happen all the time in newsrooms, and there's virtually no expectation of transparency around things, partially because it is done under the guise of like the ethical black box of protecting sources and other institutions that came out of earlier eras. But if you actually look at the expectations for transparency and multi-stakeholderism, the expectations brought to platforms is so far beyond what is expected of newspapers now. You have fact-checking, yes, and that is like the institutional ethical framework that is in the newsroom. But all these other things that are now put upon platforms are weirdly lopsided with a bunch of other institutions in American life. And I would also say, like, perhaps unfairly, in that like the, you know, cause as we talk about content moderation, like when I didn't get accepted to many different schools, I didn't get an appeal and I didn't get to ask what the decision looked like. As I said, when people spike stories in newspapers, there's no expectation that you get an account of why something was preemptively taken down. So I think the speech norms and expectations that have been developed out of platforms are very interesting and represent like an advancement of people's expectations about technologies and, and speech technologies in a democratic in, uh, in, you know, set of institutions, but they are weirdly now outpacing a lot of other traditional ones. So I would actually push back on the fact-checking side, perhaps yes, but in a whole bunch of other ways, Sorry, let me, the, let... news institutions often get played and attention hacked in ways that trust and safety teams at platforms know how to counteract this. Absolutely. I'm not saying that the, that traditional media is not full of problems and often doesn't live up to the standards that we impose on ourselves. But what I think what I'm trying to get at is that, and, and then I, I want to hear from Alex and Renee Sorry. is- <laughs> Don't um, drag you into the, into the melee. I know we suck, okay, we'll be better. Um, is, you know, like, it's, it's not just about accuracy. Um, when a newspaper is deciding, when a, good, when a good news organization is deciding what to publish, there are a lot of, you know, there are various values that go into that, um, that de determine like newsworthiness or, you know, and, and they often screw up and you can question them. But whereas when Facebook or TikTok is deciding what to show you, there's one, there's basically one value up front, which is what is this person going to pay attention to? And then the, the, for at least most of the existence of social media, the, the, the dominant paradigm is, and then we put in all this stuff on the back end to try to mitigate when that goes wrong. And so what I, I guess what, I, what I'm trying to say is um, how, how, because this really intersects with, with, with your career going from medium where it's really about just the existence or not of something to uh, the trust and safety where it's about what's being recommended. Where, where are the norms that replace simply, hey, what's, this, what's the most likely thing that somebody's going to pay attention to? Yeah, I have a, a brief thought on that is one of the hardest things I think for algorithms to do or for tech to do is to measure the difference between what we want and what we want to want. This is like a, set, like a spiritual self-improvement subjunctive. And so, <laughs> um, you know, this is like, I think the same thing with film is good at the present tense, but it's not good at the subjunctive. It's like, with Medium, we used to sit around and think about this for the algorithm. Like, people do want to improve. There's a mania for self-improvement in American life, and that's why people want, like, listicles of nine ways to do whatever. But they also, but how do you serve, if somebody likes long form journalism on X, how do you also connect them with something Y that has that same like improvement impulse that newspaper reporters have to like improve civic life? And based on data of what people's revealed preferences are, I think I leave it to other folks. It's very hard to do more than give people more of what they appear to be asking for. It's very hard to give them what their aspirational self might want. And it's arguably maybe paternalistic, but I think that's like a level of like, I don't know that people would not 
do that, I think it's very hard to get into the guts of how do you have a recommendation engine that is geared towards, um, again, what we want to want as opposed to what we want, because people you know, order the kale and eat the candy, and that's sort of like the human dilemma that leads all these things that, um, that, that technology simply amplifies. I, so, I mean, to take Alex aside, I mean, the, the actual like empirical social science research now has really kind of, is continually putting nails in the coffin of kind of the media ex, uh, idea that like algorithms are the problem. Over and over again, people who actually study it, we're getting the real evidence now, demonstrate that, that almost always the people who are getting radicalized are not getting radicalized by, they are making the choice, they're participating in their own radicalization, they are looking for stuff, right? Like one of our postdocs just wrote a paper with a bunch of other people on this on YouTube. There's been all this talk about YouTube pushing people to radical directions and stuff and the actual evidence shows that's not true. The people who are, who are consuming really radical stuff is because they're looking for it and they're finding it. Now you can argue whether or not those platforms should allow them to get to that stuff, but the, I think, one of the kind of traditional media shibboleths over the last five, six years, and it is really six years, because it's like, this all starts with Trump winning, and I think Joe Bernstein's piece in The Atlantic was actually quite good on this, that a lot of the discussion of this is It was just, Harper's, just to give Harper's credit. I'm sorry, Harper's, I'm sorry, I'm very proud of it, I'm sorry, good. I'm sorry, yeah, um, Harper's um, was accurate, and like, a bunch of this discussion is really just still, you know, normie liberals trying to to make sense of Trump winning and reaching for, it had to be the algorithms and it took six years, but now like, when somebody says that, that means they don't read the literature. Is, is like what I, is generally. Some, some of us were saying 2017, by the oh, way. Oh, no, and Citing I, the example too. of WhatsApp, I, I totally which agree. has no algorithm and has caused problems left and right. I mean, it's not. Right, yeah. right. WhatsApp has a huge problem. Right. Right. WhatsApp has, I mean, WhatsApp is the best example of this. I'm like, right. the most dangerous social network in India and Brazil in a bunch of different ways is WhatsApp. Yep. WhatsApp has total privacy, no advertising, makes absolutely no money, no algorithmic ranking, right? But what it does do is it allows people to amplify their speech and allows people to, to join groups where they radicalize themselves and then that they push their they, they push that and proselytize that to other people and so like I, I do I, I think like just every the algorithm discussion because one of the things I think the algorithm discussion is good a lot of people in the media like it because it lets them pretend that this is an easy thing that's like this is this constant kind of like as, oh if, if if techies just did more, more social, you know, if they took more social science classes, um, then the world would be better because their algorithms are bad. One, the worst people I worked with in Silicon Valley were all um, uh, from a, a school in Boston, uh, social science, <laughs> and mostly had JDs or MBAs, right? Like they were not engineers. Um, it was the lawyers and like uh, people who like were very well educated in the way that like it, it was liberal arts majors are the ones who are making some of the worst decisions. And second, it's just like, it's empirically not the algorithms that are driving people to do this. It's what people want. Right. I, I just worth pointing out, though, that I, I, can pl I totally agree with you that the, the, like, the, the, the algorithmic radicalization hypothesis has been really severely weakened. But just want to note that um, radicalization is not the only possible negative yeah. consequence of badly designed recommendation algorithms. Right. There is the group recommendation algorithm that's not great. And that, right. and that person. There are. I mean, and I, I do think there are recommendation algorithms. I, I, I teach, I have this slide with this triangle of like the danger of different parts of the product. And to me, the top is advertising because you're paying for speech amplification. And so for me, advertising is where you have the least freedom of speech and platforms have the more responsibility. And underneath that is recommendation algorithms. Yeah. I'm not saying that those algorithms are good. I'm just saying like you could get rid of, if every platform was like WhatsApp and just complete reverse chrono, None of these pro societal problems would go away. Right. right. I mean, there are there. Are, sorry. Go ahead. Rita. No, no. Go ahead. Oh, I mean, there there are other alternatives. There's a guy I know, um, Jeff Allen, who recently started uh, the Integrity Institute, who's, who uh, used to be at Facebook, um, and his. You know, he, he, his argument is that you should actually look at Google Search as a model, where Google Search is the kind of like the origin, the OG ranking algorithm in some ways, and it's they index for quality and whatever other pathologies Google and its various um, corporate uh, uh, entities have, it's pretty good at organizing like results that are more accurate or better and not worse. Yeah, um, except for like uh, the dark arts of SEO and like the entire industry designed to gaming it. I feel like it's... Well, it's, it's adversarial, but they do try. I think the one thing that I always was struck by with Google search was that they had this conceptualization called your money or your life. 
and it argued that there were certain topics that deserved a higher standard of care. Just as we move into this idea that, you know, people are going to be wrong on the internet, that's, you know, big deal, right? But there are certain areas where being wrong or actively curating something that is wrong carries a particular type of potential consequence, like, you, you know, financial scams, right? If you go searching for Bitcoin and everything that comes up is some bullshit thing that's going to, like, steal all your money, then you have a problem. If you have a cancer diagnosis and you type in the name of your cancer and it gives you a bunch of, like, juice bullshit, then you have a problem. And so this idea of your money or your life was basically saying that for certain areas, there is a higher standard of care. There is something that we have to come up with a conceptualization of harms. And again, not the hand-wavy bullshit notion of harms where you're like somebody said something nasty on the internet, but something where there's like an actual tangible outcome. And I think that is where the, the trend in moderation has been shifting is towards applying that your money or your life, which I think that framework was like 2012 to 2015 timeframe was when they came up with that. It predated the fake news stuff. It predated that kind of backlash because they already recognized at that point that they had a responsibility. But, but how do you tell the truth there, right? Like follow the science. What, what you're basically claiming is that there's harms that aren't actual physical violent harm. Again, it isn't the Brandenburg standard. There are it's harms that aren't actual physical harms. If you lose all of your money and are homeless, then maybe you've just experienced a harm, right? Okay, I mean, fine, there's securities fraud law. But getting back to the example of um, some fruit bullshit around cancer. Well, guess what? A lot of the early narrative around COVID was wrong, right? Or at least questionable. Yeah, um, but, but that's a developing, emerging story that's distinctly different than we as oncologists have practiced medicine in this field and we know that eating this mushroom is not going to do anything and there's like, you know, 30 years of, of studies that have arrived at that conclusion. If you're arguing that Google should be serving you the mushrooms, I, I, I would assume that I think you're actually probably and, in the minority sorry, on and, that front. And so Google's going to be the truth oracle and every claim about the empirical world. Everything is rated. Somebody is going to be the oracle. I, I miss. I mean, I, I, that, I think this is where I'm saying it's impossible. Like, you, right. how it would you actually ranked. implement this? It it's impossible. Ranked. So, so what do you do? Do you just put the most recent mushroom article at the top? I mean, that, that's so a separate problem. But, do? but there's no truth ranking, right? There's no magical truth AI that will rank everything. By well, truth. Uh, but, but but Google does attempt to provide the most reliable and the most accurate results. I mean, that is what the company, as currently constituted, does. Right. I mean, uh, so they have like achieved medical, like on medical stuff, they have a chief medical officer and they have a whole team whose job it is to go do searches for cancer cures and stuff. And they go and they not just do your standard. I mean, it is interesting. Like you talk about SEO, like black SEO is like one of the biggest, most profitable kinds of trust and safety problems in one of the original ones, right? Of, of a huge number of people who are highly motivated to spam into the Google index. Um, but beyond just their normal, like anti SEO stuff, they do have people who actually look through and have like an editorial voice okay. uh, on, on medical stuff. That's an, but that's an unscalable human pro problem. You're not gonna... No, well, but the, so the question is, is, is it unscalable if you, if you choose? I mean, the interesting thing for, thing for Google is it's only the first three pages that matter, right? So it's actually, you, you don't care if that stuff ends up in page 137 of the results because nobody will ever see it, right? Yeah. So, so for them, I don't think it is unscalable. Oh, but for, well, come on. But for how many queries would that be true? Well, so this is the interesting thing. I think like one of... Like this, I, I think we're starting to move to a world where one, the thing people care about is, like the standard 2017 New York Times story was I saw something bad on Facebook and I did not like it, therefore <laughs> Facebook is evil, right? And there was never, in like the 2017, 2018 era, there was never any and understanding honestly, still of still like, 2021, I'm afraid. Yeah. <laughs> right, right, yeah. So maybe it's still that today. Maybe I'm giving it, But like, that's like the standard kind of media. It's like, I saw this one thing on social media and I didn't like it. And there was never any kind of context of like, what was the actual reach? What was the actual engagement? Did it actually change anybody's minds? Or was this just like a, a funny little political thing people were talking about? And... Um, I think hopefully, if we want to be smarter about this, you can say, well, on these 10 topics where people are actually dying today, on vaccine disinformation, on fake cancer cures, on I'm, I'm searching for Bitcoin and I can lose my entire life savings if instead of getting Coinbase, I get some total Nigerian scam at the top. Um, for those 10 things, you care about the top 10 results, right? That, that is scalable. It is not scalable to, to solve the long tail problem for these, but you can improve kind of for the 80, 90% of people who are in the thick part of the curve, you can make things better for them. But I, but I, well, well I, I don't know. We both worked at Facebook, Alex, right? right. Remember one of the whistleblower things from Facebook was that she, she, I think she was on the ops team and there was some election in El Salvador and some op opposition candidate was using Facebook pages or just various dark right. patterns to actually influence the election. I mean, you and I have sat inside Facebook and looked at you know, dashboards in which every number is in of order of billions, right? Billions of posts, billions of people, billions of impressions, right? Something like some weird little El Salvadorian political scandal doesn't even show up in the noise of those dashboards, right? The thought that you're going to get it right in every country in the world, three plus 
billion Facebook users, more, you know, there are more Facebook users than there are Christians on the planet. And, and you're going to tell me that you're actually going to correctly adjudicate no, some I, vague I don't notion of so. truth in every country in the world and, and every medical concern in the world? How, that, that isn't scalable, right? So, I want to... Sorry, we're, yeah, go ahead. No, I, no, no, it's fine. I, go, I wanted to go back and sort of characterize part of what is, is I think, is happening. And one of them is that the accuracy part of the debate is like, a lot of these things about reliability and accuracy eventually sort of tie off to external and non-internet institutions, which is sort of like the CDC and the WHO. And, and I think part of Antonio's point is like the space for skepticism for the Martin Luthers of the world to register skepticism of like institutions gets squashed and either, either, either strategically reduced out of the, for the top three pages where you can say it hasn't been censored to zero, but it's been dimmed by 90%, the, the same way maybe a Martin Luther, you know, the, the, non, the non-doctrinaire people who, who fit into the anti-vax movement right. I mean, ha- yeah. have, have been dimmed, right. and that's strategic and that's intentional. And the institutions, the, the, and the way we're doing it is not post-internet, it is essentially an appeal to elite institutions and what people say based on their education and blah 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 right. That's one sort of thing, and you can sort of play with the dials and knobs however you want. The second part that, that I thought Antonio and Renee were sort of nailing really, really, really illustratively was that harm is also a drifting concept for um, yeah. generations, which is like the like, if I don't punch you in the face, it is not harm standard, is certainly a venerable traditional American standard. But the subjective harms around psychological harms and intimidation and plausibly deniable causing a mob to descend on your home and uh, intimidation and microaggressions, if you check people out demographically and generationally, their views on what constitutes harm are gonna be very different and it drifts a lot depending on, on what community you belong to. And, and it, it's moving a ton generationally, I would say. And the second part of that is when you're doing this in platform land, you're also doing it probabilistically. Because yeah. you're saying, like, what is the likelihood of some set of harms to happen based on a bunch of factors? And that, I think, is the, where the rubber meets the road in, I don't want to say the impossibility of ever doing this right, but it's basically pre-crime. Like, um, uh, uh, my old team at Medium used to use the, the names of the precogs from um, <laughs> Minority Report as their, as their fake names for the outgoing user tickets, like Dashiell and the other, um, because, because if you are being honest with yourself, you're using, you're using statistical and probabilistic reasoning as well as you can to say, if person X who is powerful and has Y number of followers makes, sta- makes plausibly deniable statement Y, which is like, gee, I hope nothing bad happens to this person, the likelihood that, uh, that something violent will happen is non-zero, and it's not knowable with precision, but trust and safety or integrity teams will eyeball it or use whatever instrumentation they have and say, like, this hit the threshold, we're breaking the glass and pulling the plug. Well, and, that, and that, I think, is ne- it's very hard to get comfortable with that, but I think that is actually what happens, however instrumented or, 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 or um, bolted on other things get to it. There's a, I, I do think we need to think about how to resolve the tension of the algorithmic recommendations don't matter that much and bumping something down the algorithmic recommendations list is is like a form of censorship that that has consequences i think we can say that the algorithms i feel like actually i'm just debating everyone um (laughs) which uh i'm gonna get a bonus from zach after uh just i don't know it, it, it feels like the hard version of algorithmic recommend, recommenders don't matter. I don't think anyone can really. I, stick I'm not with saying that. it doesn't matter yes. at all. I just like I the core. Sure. The core problem here is not. It's not rad- It's not the radical. Problem. And and this is also a difficult thing. Is there's no good empirical evidence that either labeling or yeah. even some of the downranking stuff is really effective. Hmm. Um, but like it's effective in keeping people from seeing it. Is it? But when we talk about harm, is it actually effective of causing harm? Because the part of the problem here is on all these stress and, on a lot of these stress and safety issues, the a very small percentage of people cause a massive disproportionate amount of the harm, right? So when you're talking about like the Kiwi Farms problem, yes, it's full of hate speech and like people might go to it and be like, oh, now, I, now I'm a hateful person. Wait, sorry, let, let's talk about that. Okay, so let me just well, I think, that up. I think it's a great actual yeah, that's, that example. Yeah, was, it, was, it was next. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, so for just, just to, for, for those who haven't, who mercifully haven't been following this, so I guess um, Kiwi Farms is, was um, like a, kind of an 8chan-esque message board were with, featuring a lot of crude, trollish, and sometimes quite hateful behavior. And uh, I had never uh, heard of it until, until recently, certainly never visited it. Um, <laughs> oh, <geez. laughs> um, 
and uh, there, did you use your real name for? Because I feel like Gilly would play. That. Are you not supposed well, to? Well, yeah, on Kiwi Farm, um, but not my middle name. I, only the, my last four digits of my social. So I think it's right. Be fine. Okay, good. Um, so, so a lot of really ugly and uh, specifically a lot of anti-trans stuff on Kiwi Farms, and this led a a, a prominent streamer who's trans uh, to like sort of. I guess she was the recipient of abuse there, and then she sort of tr started a, you know, st started trying to, a campaign to try to bring Kiwi Farms down, which in part focused on Cloudflare, the the security uh, provider, uh, which has sort of famously a couple of times withdrawn its services from other controversial uh, websites. Cloudflare uh, at first uh, put up a defiant blog post not mentioning Kiwi Farms by name, but just saying here's our principles and implicitly why we're not gonna take down Kiwi Farms. And then four days later they posted, okay, we've taken down Kiwi Farms. And um, what they said was there had just got, become this level of you know, imminent violent threats that we just couldn't, we couldn't allow, we couldn't tolerate here. Um, but it also seems hard to deny that they were reacting to a great deal of public pressure, media attention, and on some level, the that was also generating the bad behavior on the platform uh, as a kind of reaction to the attention. So anyway, so so Alex, I wanted to ask you, um, how how do you assess Cloudflare's responsibility in a situation like this? Let, let's take at their word that there were you know, specific threats of violence um, that, that, that were really alarming to them. How, how do you assess their responsibility given where they fit in the, you know, the architecture of the internet? Right, so that, I mean, the, the core of the Cloudflare problem is that this is one of those really hard tech equity trade-offs that lots of people agree that internet infrastructure should be neutral and should not make editorial decisions. When they're thinking about that, they're often thinking about ISPs, right? right. Because Comcast ISPs, shouldn't decide. Comcast, AT&T, Verizon, effectively because they are an oligopoly, right? Like, right. I only, there's only one way for me to get really high-speed internet at my house, it's AT&T, and so you don't want them making decisions about editorially what I can see. Mm -hmm. um, and so the internet infrastructure should be neutral, but then also that providers have a responsibility for the content they're hosting. Cloudflare is right there in the middle in that they provide a bunch of infrastructure services like DNS and such. Yeah, what, what, sorry, just for, <clears throat> what do they do? Okay, so, so, this is, so this goes to the core of where they're gonna end up in trouble, which is you go to Cloudflare and you can set up your site and you tell Cloudflare, first I'm gonna have you host my DNS name, right? So when you would go and say, kiwifarms.com and your computer would go ask where is kiwifarms.com that would f that would go to a cloudflare one of their tens or hundreds of thousands of servers that would answer it is at this ip address that ip address then would be a cloudflare ip address that is close to you um, and what they will do is they would then go back to kiwi farms's host which in this case was in like a, a bulletproof hoster in las vegas but could be in russia could be wherever at a place that like is not super uh you know um uh, doesn't have a lot of laws around this, and they grab the content and they bring it close to you, right? So, like every Kiwi Farms post was replicated ten thousand times in ten thousand Cloudflare servers around the world. And so, if you, if I went from my house, it would probably go to the Cloudflare. Their biggest one close to me is San Jose, and so it'd pull it out of memory in San Jose and be much faster. That has the benefit of making it faster and more responsive. It also prevents people from taking it down through a distributed denial service attack, because if you do an attack where you have 100,000 bots and you send a bunch of traffic to, to kiwifarms.com, what happens is that gets smeared across 100,000 Cloudflare servers all over the world, and they have demonstrated they can handle 40, 50, 60 terabit per second denial of service attacks. Like, realistically, you can't take Cloudflare down. There's four or five companies that size, right? So like Microsoft with the Azure CDN, Google with the, uh, and Google Clouds in their CDN, Facebook, um, a couple other companies are at the size where you can't DDoS them. So even and Cloudflare though, can provide that to other people. So it sounds like even though Cloudflare isn't in a position like your ISP, where it's literally the only game in town, right. there's not many. There's not many. No, well, right. There's like Akamai, Cloudflare, Fastly. There's three or four CDNs of that caliber, all of whom have much stricter policies than Cloudflare did, mm -hmm. right? And so the problem is, is because Cloudflare... There was an arbitrage thing here that if you're a bad guy, one, Cloudflare has a free tier, so they'll provide you a lot of these services without paying them anything, um, which is great, especially if you don't want to know, be known who you are because you don't have to put a credit card in. Um, but second, uh, 
it was, you know, they had a much more libertarian policy on this than Akamai. Akamai would never allow, you know, Akamai makes their money from J.P. Morgan Chase and probably Major League Baseball and people who need huge amounts of bandwidth, like with real big corporate clients, they don't have a free tier. And so Cloudflare was your only option if you were Kiwi Farms, realistically. So if you're the company that's like, yeah, we'll sort of take anybody, then you are the one who's going to end up with the problem of right. some of our customers. Right, which is, really which is the problem they created for themselves by advertising, we, we are the defenders of freedom on the internet. It, you're also advertising to a certain segment of people of like, we want your business. That might not be what you're trying to say, but that effectively what, what happens. I, I would just add just the idea that like, <clears throat> as, as described so, so well, it sort of aggregates a couple of different infrastructure services. Yes. But you, you also used, before Cloudflare got so good at that, you would generally buy like your CDN services separately than your D, anti-DDoS services. Right. And they're, they're all still available like Amazon, has CDN services. Like they're out there in the world. The integrated cloud for a package happens to just be really excellent and, and super easy. Grown. Yeah. yeah. So um, it's not, so it's so sort of like it's 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 a, a premium option, not necessarily literally for money, but like it's a, it's a it's a really good service. But um, losing Cloudflare doesn't necessarily mean that you cease to exist. Um, you, right. you, you like and and so like the Daily Stormer, the Nazi website, um, Ha, you know, re eventually after Cloudflare got rid of it, they found new a new provider. Um, which Renee, I wanted to ask you about this. Um, we see this also at the level of the network itself. Like when people get deplatformed yeah. from you know, banned from Twitter, maybe they go to Gab or Parler or something, um, and you're kind of pushing the water around the balloon. How do you weigh? On the one hand, if somebody's kicked off of Twitter fewer people are going to see what they have to say. But on the other hand, if they then go with a bunch of like-minded people in a more permissive and less publicly scrutinized place, the like intensity of the badness is going to be worse. So how do you see like in your research those trade-offs playing out? Well, I mean those are the those are the trade-offs. And I think the again one of the things where I know I'm sitting on this side but I've said many times is I actually don't think takedowns make sense except in a capacity where there is some sort of demonstrable harm. And again, there's this debate about what that you know what constitutes harm and over what time horizon there is harm. Um, but you know, in, I remember in 2019, Facebook was trying to think about what do, you know what to do about the uh, rise of the anti-vaccine activism on its platform. And this was before COVID, to be clear. This was when there were measles outbreaks in Brooklyn and then in American Samoa. And the one in American Samoa killed 80 kids. And the government of Samoa was trying to institute a measles immunization campaign, mandatory, I believe, um, to stop the spread of measles because children were dying. And American anti-vaccine activists were like descending upon the page of the government of Samoa screaming that in fact the vaccines were going to kill the kids and so on and so forth and that you know just this this um, the government was trying to take control of a crisis and and these people were I mean they were doing all they were kind of like connecting with anti-vaccine activists there and trying to send vitamin C and then these people were trying to get into the hospitals to encourage people whose kids were in the hospitals who had already been hospitalized with measles to take their vitamin C and to reject the medical treatment so this had become a thing and one of the questions that, that Facebook had to reckon with at this point was, what do you do about the fact that it was, in fact, the recommendation engine that had helped those groups grow so large in 2015 and 2017 before they began to pull um, certain groups out of, out of recommendation systems? And the solution was, well, we'll let people stay on the platform, but we're going to make it harder to find the content. We're going to downrank it. And so we're certainly not going to be actively pushing it and pushing it into people's feeds. Um, and that, you know, that to me, I felt like, okay, this is at least a, you know, it's not a, it's not a censorship, it's not a takedown, it doesn't turn them into martyrs for free speech. Um, it doesn't turn them into a forbidden knowledge that creates a temptation that makes people want to go find this content. It just says, okay, we are going to not make it, we are not going to promote this content, we're not going to serve up this content in recommendations. When you search for it, we are not going to return these things. When people in American Samoa are looking for information on measles, we are going to have reputable health authorities as they try to contain this epidemic. And to me, that, that seemed like a, um, you know, a very reasonable way to to handle that to handle that distinction what we've seen since there is this phenomenon where people will get deplatformed they will uh, wind up on telegram is the most 
kind of commonplace these days. You know, there is, funny enough, even though Parler and Gab, you know, well, Parler and Truth Social and some of these other ones, they say that they don't moderate, they do, in fact, moderate. Um, and so that's kind of an interesting dynamic. So as people roll to platforms, it's like regulatory arbitrage almost, right? You're like finding the most permissible place to go, but even there, there's gonna be some moderation. Um, so what, what you usually ultimately have is people move to Telegram. The problem is, the experience of Telegram is like this constant, like roiling chat stream. It's very hard to have any persistence. Things just move very fast. So in a way, the design actually like impacts who chooses to stay. Some people will choose to stay, um, but a lot will begin to drop off. So you'll see Facebook, I remember, t uh, took down like a Stop the Steal group um, in 2020 that had begun to get sort of violent. They tried to move it to Telegram. There were something like 300,000 people, if I'm not mistaken, when Facebook took it down, um, and about you know 20,000 or so in the Telegram chat. But you just see these you know, these things go by it's much like more quickly. Live, it's like a live stream chat. It's like a live comes. stream chat if you've never uh, spent time on Telegram. And so what you what happens though, interestingly, is you don't have quite the same like coordination that happens around a piece mm. of content. You know, it, it just changes the dynamic of the community. There's a lot of research right now as deplatforming has become more common into you know where that where that trade-off lies. What you should do. Should should you go with this approach of like reduce, leave it up, make it harder to find, or should you go with this approach of of actively take down and then um, you know see what happens in the in the resulting community? So can I, I make can I make a comment? Please, please. Yeah. So you know, it's funny you mentioned Telegram. I use Telegram a lot now because I'm in crypto, and like it's all crypto stuff and the war in Ukraine. Because in Ukraine, everyone uses Telegram, so it's literally like news from the front and then some like Web three crypto bro talking about some ridiculous protocol. Um, and and you're, it's exactly as you described. It's this bizarre, chaotic sort of messaging system. Um, so you mentioned you're a Gen Xer who played with rusty nails. So I was a Gen Xer who set up my own HTTP server back in the day. Like I had the box with a stable IP from Earthlink, and like I went to my website and I'd hear the hard drive go, and I ran my own like mail <laughs> server, and like I. Asked actually had like a little front end too. I'd use Pine, which is still the world's best email client. And I'd send email. Like no one could take me off the internet. I had total internet freedom. Of course, like anything would make my little box kick over in a second. There was nothing <laughs> for at the moment. But you know, a lot of the solutions to this, and if anyone had their bingo card, like someone saying Web3 solves this, I'm about to say this, Web3 <laughs> solves this in the sense that if you build the internet around protocols, like everything we're discussing here is because there are platforms, right? Yeah. It's because there are closed platforms that can basically pull the plug on things, right? If you have protocols, no one can kick you off of email. And that's not totally true in the sense that if you were really nauseous enough, at some point Gmail would kick you off. But broadly speaking, compared to being on Facebook, no, you cannot be killed off, you know, kicked off of um, you know, Bitcoin or Ethereum or email or a lot of other things, right? And so it's just, if you talk to people in crypto, a lot of it's like, well, can't be evil is better than, you know, don't be evil, right? Because this whole Google don't be evil thing, that's, they don't actually follow that policy, right? And so you make it such that the internet can't be evil, evil as defined by people who are of libertarian persuasion, um, and that's actually the solution to this. And yeah. we'll cover that in tomorrow's yeah. nine-hour session. What is Web3? <laughs> yeah, I, mean, oh. yeah. I was going to say, I was going to give 30 seconds on like... Okay, then we've got to do Q&A. And which, which is that I think, I think Web3, I spend a lot of time thinking about and working with like Web3 projects now on what will happen because I think the do, think do nothing as always sounds awesome, but it's not actually going to be possible as long as nation states have power. Yep. And so some of the, some of the um, like I work with a project called IPFS, um, which is Interplanetary File System, um, called Filecoin, and there's questions around what does anti-censorship mean in the context of sort of realistic legal compliance because do nothing is probably not going to work. Um, but it is also true that if you have the coordinated response or the uncoordinated response, rather, of many different, say, storage providers or node operators or yeah. aspiring Antonios who are running their own or whatever modern-day equivalent of Pine is, which is probably Elm, um, like, uh, <laughs> they might choose in the thousands to all not host some piece of content because they all think it is noxious and violent and, and dangerous maybe. And they might make different decisions about where that line is. And what you'll get is a plurality of things that are less available based on probably how noxious or dangerous or, or, or whatever they are. And it's sort of, hope, I'm hoping with the right tooling, replicate some of the effect that Alex and Renee are talking about, are talking about which is that you dim it but the dimming will not happen by one finger at one large company. It will happen through thousands of nodes making independent decisions about how available something should be based on sort of their values. That's sort of the utopian story of Web3 allowing for moderation to happen in a true community sense where each node will have some power, but no single node will have all the power and will sort of transcend platform land, sort of coming soon to a hard drive near you. But, um, <laughs> this, this right. may, but this may be the next 10 years of like, 
what, how things look. But okay, as somebody I, who's wait, worked sorry, in child I safety, must, <laughs> like, I simply must open up the Q and A. Grace is going to fire me. As somebody who's worked in, in child safety, yeah. append only Merkle tr distributed Merkle trees. I mean, anybody who runs Bitcoin D right now, you have undeletable child sexual abuse material that is illegal under 18 USC 2252. Is that it? Um, on your hard drive. Merry Christmas. There's nothing you can do to get rid of it. So, like, like the Web three world when interacting especially, like we're talking about the political stuff, the child stuff is not that complicated from a political perspective, but the amount of, it is the worst thing that happens every day because the actual volume of the child abuse that happens online is, is spectacularly large. And th those are the guys that infect everything. And I think Web3 has not had at all a reckoning of the idea of distributed file systems that can't be censored of what's going to happen when that gets in certain groups figured and, out that And this is why I'm trying to get Thorne. No, no more Web3. Web3 conversation <laughs> is it. over. Okay. It's done. But Q and A time. Can we all sell a coin while we're up here? <laughs> yeah, no, of course. We'll do that after <laughs> that. The mingle at the meet and greet. The meet and greet, exactly. All right, thanks everyone. So, if this is your first event ever, Q and A is for questions. So please raise your hand, and Lauren and I will Not bring CNA. you a microphone. <laughs> <laughs> Can they have a seven-part question? Actually, comments are fine. One-part questions only. It's more of a comment. Hi, my name is Sarah. Um, I work in public policy and legislation up in Sacramento. So I am just wondering about your guys' Shut perspective. Down. Sorry. <laughs> um, on your guys' perspective on for any of these issues, if there, if you guys think that there is potentially a government response, because I tend to lean away from it. But if you think there's any sort of responsibility for the government or any sort of intervention, because I know a lot of my members up in Sacramento very much, you know, these discussions happen about like, well, do we intervene? We are fighting with, you know, freedom of speech and all these kind of other issues, but you know, privacy issues. So just your guys' perspective on if there is a public policy response, what is it to what extent or not? So if I may, the California Child Safety Design Code is a disaster um, <laughs> and was ridiculous. The only benefit is it doesn't start until January, 2024. So now California has realistically a year for us to actually pass a law that actually will keep kids safe that isn't written by a dilettante who's never actually done any of the work. So. Um, so that's, but that's what scares me about Sacramento is because it is easy, California being one of the world's most important jurisdictions. Um, uh, there are wonderful people in the, the capital and I'm, I'm a Sac Town guy. I've, went to, I've been to a gazillion Kings games, uh, 100 wins, 270 losses. Yeah. Um, uh, but like it is easy for, it is much easier for crazy stuff to happen in Sacramento than it is in DC, if partially just because stuff doesn't happen in DC at all. And so <laughs> I think it's great for Sacramento to get involved, but man, drive down 80 or come take the, the Amtrak to go talk to people who actually work in these problems because like having people who make documentaries from the UK actually dictate the law in California when the most important 5,000 people in trust and safety work in the five county Bay area, five or six counties, that, that's just ridiculous. That's completely ridiculous. And it, it really disappoints me that that law both p passed with all of these votes because nobody could stand against it. So we've got like a year to fix it. Do you have any suggestions? I'm yeah, so I'm actually talking some folks. I'm happy to talk with you later because we're talking, our SIO, we're, we're engaging with a bunch of people in Sacramento yeah. of like, hey, now we have a deadline. Let's do something that's actually legitimately useful. This is what Q&As are all about. There we go. Yeah. <laughs> uh, hi there. Um, I was wondering, uh, recently there was a situation where uh, very controversial social media influencer, I think his name is Andrew Tate, uh, got banned off of uh, a lot of social platforms simultaneously, um, which sort of appeared to be like a bandwagon effect. I think first it was YouTube, then TikTok, then Twitter. How do you sort of avoid that? Um, how do you enforce that decentralization when platforms can sort of coordinate uh, behind closed doors? I don't think that there was coordination behind closed doors. I do think that when one acts, you do see the dominoes fall, and, and it's interesting. That, that story, and maybe, uh, maybe if you know more about like, where the reporting has gone on it, um, I followed it because I thought this, is, this person seems like such a, like a clown. Like, you can easily counter speak against this. Like, why are we taking it down? And again, this, this notion of martyrdom, right? Um, there was something that was written about um, that he, he was like under investigation for some sort of trafficking and had produced content related, you know, that, that was like ancillary to that investigation and that that was why he had come down, which potentially means there is a violation that would then fall under all. They have similar policies and so there is this moment where like the momentum happens, somebody hits a strike and then the others decide, that, you know, they will reevaluate moderation decisions that they've made. Andrew Tate is not the only example of this. Um, but in that particular case, and I don't know if there's been an update since 
the news cycle moves so fast, it's so hard to keep up, but there was this allegation related to trafficking that had somehow been used to justify the first takedown. If, if all those companies got a search warrant on that, then that will be that 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 will cause like a coordination. If you end up with a bunch of people get search warrants on like an actual, it's it's crime. it's it's a, it's a fair question though because I mean even even if it's not behind closed doors, it doesn't have to be. When you have extremely concentrated markets, whatever the field, whatever the sector is, it becomes easy to coordinate to collude without colluding, right? You can say things in public, uh, and and we see you know you could you can do price fixing um, by just just with public statements. So it is it is a real concern that you see like. Herd mentality among this very small, very powerful herd. Yep. Yeah. I don't know the specifics of this, but I'm not defending I, whoever this was who got kicked off. They probably deserved it. <laughs> it's just like like the hustle porn kind of like. <laughs> I, I, think, I think that's fair, and I think and and also for if you know folks at all these companies, everybody knows they're like incapable of coordinating. Probably if just like, but I think you're right that there's like a bandwagon effect, <laughs> and there's also like a cloud cover effect of like, oh, if those three companies did it and we do it, we will not create a headline. So there's right there's, once there's, the first mover makes the first move, then. Yeah, I think there's like an everybody into the pool effect, um, and, and and I think one of the one of the upshots, which which is implicitly I think said before, right, is that you, if if that happens to enough people or the market gets concentrated enough, you wind up with this sort of like right wing stack or the necessity of like what what I think the Gap founders yeah. is like, oh, we need we need an we need an all right wing stack where it's like, and hopefully it will be of the same quality of service, but like if you're you know if you're unwanted or or if you're despised by whatever mainstream. Um, whatever you want to say, normie wokes, then like you can go to the right wing stack and then right. you can like have a haven. But that doesn't seem to have happened. And like part of what was interesting with Kiwi Farms is like they went to Russia and then Russia. It, it sounded like they sort of like bought some services and they got kicked off the services very quickly. Right, DDoS server is like a Russian Cloudflare that yeah. they were beneath even them. I, I mean, so I think there's a there. I, the person who I think talks about this the best is Evelyn Dueck, who is mm -hmm. going to be a colleague of ours at Stanford Law this fall, where she does talk. The, the place where there is coordination is GIF-CT, which is like an anti-terrorism group. Um, so like the two topics in which there's coordination, Silicon Valley on trust and safety is child safety and um, counterterrorism. Um, and so for those, I think there, you can have like a legitimate argument, although um, that wouldn't be relevant to this. Hey, I'm Danny O'Brien. I'm with the Falcon Foundation. And, hey, Danny. Uh, hey, hey, hey. Yeah. And actually, I've talked to Gilad so much about Web3, even I'm sick of it, so I'm not going to talk <laughs> yeah, about Yeah, don't that. you dare. <laughs> What's that? Are you on to yeah. Web4, dude? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'm, I'm so many webs ahead of all of you. It's unbelievable. <laughs> um, so uh, the, my question is actually in something that everyone's kind of touched on, and Antonio talking about the El Salvador case, and, and you, you, uh, Alex mentioning that, you know, the 5,000, like, experts in this area are all probably, you know, in, in the social network of the Facebook friends of the people here and certainly in the Bay Area. Like, w one of the things that doesn't appear to scale, right, or is particularly vulnerable is that you have situations where this community, this, like, you know, normie elite, right, runs uh, 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 trust and safety for the whole world. Yeah. And so what you have in that sort of situation is, is you know, minor cases like the entire, like, election in a particular country. Or in, in the experience I had with uh, uh, the Electronic Frontier Foundation is we would get these reports in the Philippines or Thailand where, like, the people were genuinely concerned and had no um, insight into whether the trust and safety departments or the um, uh, the content moderation departments of, uh, that were local to them, the people who were actually reading it in their local language, hadn't been captured by one particular political force. And so my question about scaling on this is less about you know artificial intelligence, but like actually, like you can't employ that many people to like really accurately monitor these, converse these conversations and the degree that you depend on humans building these models or actually doing the moderation. Um, how do you stop that being captured in the way that Saudi Arabia <coughs> apparently sent in people to capture Twitter? It, it's a huge problem. I, like, this is going to be, um, it's a huge problem both officially and unofficially. It has been a big problem unofficially because often one of, the, one of like my big problems with, with how Facebook does this is the policy team that does both effectively like government affairs and lobbying is the, reports up to the same people as the people who do content policy. And from my perspective, you must have a separate, those have to be separate divisions up to totally different SVPs or whatever is appropriate for the company. Um, because what you end up doing is the people who are the local experts, you know, for the tech companies, I don't think people understand, like the big tech companies, like the real, like the Facebook, Google, Amazon, whatever, have 
hundreds and hundreds of lobbyists around the world. And those people turn over whenever governments change, just like K Street in DC, that if you have, when the Congress party was replaced by the BJP in India, all of a sudden, the key people who were the winners in the India office for Facebook were very close to Modi and, and BGP, BJP members. If those people end up also being the experts in what should we do for local content moderation and the people who are making those decisions, then they will naturally gravitate towards the ruling party. And so at least in the US, you have enough people that there's a diversity of voices, that there's all kinds of arguments about it, but you don't have that diversity of voices in a bunch of these countries. And the unification of those teams, I think is a huge problem. Specifically for Facebook, I expect other companies face the same one. Um, that's the unofficial. And then officially what's now happening is that everybody is following Europe in every country wants to have their own GDPR. They want to have their own digital services act, their own digital markets act. And it's legitimate, right? Like India is a legitimate democracy. Probably more people voted for Modi than live in the United States. He was legitimately elected and invested in power, but he is now acting in a way that is in an authoritarian manner. And um, why should India not have the same power the EU has to regulate? And so the Germans with um, Nets DG broke the seal where they were able to completely change the way that content moderation worked on American platforms in Germany. And once country companies did that, they have decided for effectively every democracy, we're gonna do what they want. So I think actually this area is gonna get much worse because it's very hard to argue that a government that represents 800 million, you know, uh, 900 million billion voters does not get to legitimately control speech internally and that we should apply like First Amendment standards uh, from Menlo Park. And I wanted to throw in like, it's also even worse than you think from a competition perspective because part of, part of what was good about startups or what was thought to be good about startups was that 50 people in Menlo Park could run a service that reached and helped people all over the globe. But whether either because of li like poor localization leading to bad results or because of regulation in, in all these countries requiring content moderation. There's sort of like what's, what's like the hostage taking law, which is like every country wants you to have one person on the ground that they can go get if yep. they're mad at you. Um, you know, Medium was 70 people when I joined it. Um, it's gonna be impossible for all but the biggest companies to deliver global services. And I know there's lots of folks out there who are like, good. But, mm. I, think, <laughs> but, but I think the notion that like you could scale to global with 70 or 100 people was part of what was cool about the sort of like global anti-parochial nature of providing services at that level. And by dint of like regulation and realistic internalization of all these like political catastrophes, it now is a problem for like, when I talk to 10 person startups, they're just like, what's our Sri Lanka policy? I don't know, there's 10 of us. Um, and so I, you know, it, it's, it's something that I see young startups really contending with and, and causing them to not expand their services as widely. Yeah. And just to harp on that point, whether it comes to both trust and safety or even a notion like privacy, right? Like everyone, like it always feels good to turn a knob on privacy because who would be against it or for safety and who would be against it. But on the other side of that knob, it says competition, actually. And if you actually enforce this onerous regulatory regime, which a GDPR totally is, only companies like Facebook and Google can benefit from it. And once again, in the pages of Wired, I wrote in 2017, 18, that GDPR would only benefit Google and Facebook and actually hurt the digital markets and the digital media in, in Europe, which it yeah. absolutely did, yeah. right? Because right. only Facebook could actually- Which they've learned, which, which is why they're no longer against any of these laws. Right. Google and Facebook are, Pro DSA, right, right. pro DMA, right. because GDPR made them so much money. Right, right. I mean, they'd rather be no laws, but as, as long as there is one, of course, it benefits them. Yeah. And so, um, yeah, I mean, th this business that like a four person startup, I just raised money for a startup. The fact that I suddenly have to have a content policy team and worry about privacy from like day one, that's going to keep Facebook and Google entrenched forever, right? Because there's never going to be an upstart that actually breaks that, in that incumbency, right? Hi, my name is Liam Chu. Um, Renee, you, off, you um, suggested a book on Twitter called Network Propaganda by Halvarian. I skimmed through the first chapter, and the authors were very adamant that um, technology had nothing to do with the polarization in our society and the demise of our democracy. Um, so if that were the case, then how likely is it that all of these technological innovations that we're working on, like in Web3, how is that going to undo what's been done? Like. Um, how much do you agree with Halvarian and the team? And um, yeah. And Halvarian on, on what, sorry? And, and the other writers of the book. Oh, Halvarian, I think, is at Google. Um, the, so network propaganda made an interesting argument. It was written by uh, Yochai Benkler and um, some folk, Rob Ferris and some folks at, at Harvard. And the argument that it made um, was not so much that uh, 
It was an argument that social media itself had not undermined the 2016 election. It was looking very much at that particular phenomenon, and it was looking at it from the context of, but what about the media, right? We are neglecting to talk about the media as we talk about social media, and we're placing an unreasonable amount of blame at the feet of social media, given that there has been this entire infrastructure that has moved towards a very hyper-partisan communication style, a very insular communication style, uh, and he, they call specifically, they call attention to the right-wing propaganda machine, um, which exists and emerged in response to the belief that mainstream media had a liberal bias, and so this was created as sort of, sort of an alternative ecosystem that began to amass a particular following. Media and social media, in my view, are not actually distinct anymore, right? It is a, it is a wholly networked communication ecosystem. Um, I did not, so Yochai and I, there were some kind of, I think, differences of opinion in the question of what was going to be more important going forward. So in 2016, and in particular media environments, what we see is cable news, right, is one of the things that they point to quite a bit. Cable news has an, extreme, has an aging demographic. Very few people, uh, you know, in my, you know, I'm 40, right, but very few people in my age bracket even own a television, let alone pay for cable news. Everybody gets their information on the internet. So my thinking on it has always been that the internet becomes, in fact, increasingly important, which I think is actually borne out by the fact that most mainstream outlets, cable included, have social media platforms and turn their anchors into influencers in the social media ecosystem. So there is um, this argument that this much more kind of like top-down dynamic of information control really shaped uh, public perception and public opinion in the 2016 election. I believe going forward, the bottom-up dynamic of influencers and social networks and the decentralized information environment becomes increasingly important, leading to a need to understand what these new flows of information are doing. I think there's also a slight distinction in that I see influencers as a relatively new form of... Um, figure, somewhat unprecedented actually, enabled by the rise of social networks that gave them the tools to be media of one in a way that they wouldn't have had the, the capacity to do that if you had to control a printing press, a radio station, or television. So I think, and, and I'm not saying that that is a bad thing, just to be clear, um, I think that it is a very different thing, and I think that political opinion is increasingly shaped by those bottom-up flows, and I think that's where the, the kind of like difference of opinion um, I think network propaganda is absolutely worth reading from the standpoint of understanding like where the kind of top down bottom up divides are and how to think about the role of media in the ecosystem. But it's it's six years old, right? S five years old, the book, so a lot's changed. I mean, you watch it Tucker now. It takes like two now. years to get a book out the door. Right. Also, I'm finding. So. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you watch Tucker now, and like the entire show is like taking totally online conservative stuff and then making it like palatable for fifty for sixty year olds, right? I think it used and then to be selling like, them gold and adult diapers. Media set the agenda and we would talk about what we saw on television and now the people on television talk about what we say on the internet. Right. And, and I think the other, another notable part of this like disruption of bottom up and top down flows is, was the TikTok coverage of the Johnny Depp Emperor trial that was then sort of reuptaken into the way that news outlets were covering it when they were not successfully getting um, uptakes. So the sort of like attentional game is sort of distributed across both bottom up and top down media and sort of non-coordinated collaboration. Right, I mean, it, it's a lot cheaper to find out what people are willing to pay attention to when, when it's just happening on TikTok. When it's regardless. trended already. Yeah. yeah. Uh, maybe one be, more. Yeah, this is our final question. Final question, and then we got to drink. Uh, it's kind of amazing that TikTok, it took too long for TikTok to even be mentioned, right? It seems that the, the, old. the most, the, well, yeah, me too. <laughs> but it seems like it's not maybe entirely true that the most, that all of the most, that most important 5,000 trust and safety people all work here now, right? Right. That's, that, that certainly was true maybe eight years ago, but now with the rise of TikTok and probably some, several other platforms, I think there's going to be a, there'll be a whole other thing. Uh, what does that mean for all the things we've been talking about? Yeah, I mean, so TikTok's fascinating in a couple of different ways. One, when we talk about algorithms, so the, the prime determinant of what you see on Twitter or Facebook until this last month has, was who your friends were, who you followed. Now everybody's following, chasing TikTok. TikTok from the beginning has been 100% algorithmic, right? They're like, we will, we will know you better than you'll know yourself and we will pull stuff out of the ether and put it in front of you. And your kind of expressed preference is less important than what we figure out about you. And they totally nailed it. So TikTok's fascinating because one, it's the first Chinese company to like legitimately kick the ass of the, of the 
big American social media companies by competing. WeChat is big. WeChat is big because the People's Republic of China blocks everything else. So the Chinese diaspora, if you have any family in China, you have to use WeChat, right? So like WeChat has been effectively artificially supported by the Chinese Communist Party. TikTok just went huge. They just won in the marketplace. Um, they have apparently, I, I would say there's effectively nobody there who cares at all from the free speech side. There's no Antonio argument inside of TikTok. So when our election work in 2020, when we would tell platforms about here's election disinformation, you know, YouTube might label it, Twitter might downrank it, TikTok just nukes it from the face of the planet, <laughs> right? And, and they were the fastest because like, for, so from a trust and safety perspective, none, there's none of that argument internally of like, is this free speech or whatever? As a Chinese company, like it's at all, does this not make us money or does it possibly cause any downside? Blow it away, blow it away, blow it away. So, um, so they're both like the most algorithmic and they're also the most censorious mm. of the platforms. And I think that's fascinating. And, and it is, I mean, the open questions are one, what's this mean for data access into the data of individuals? <coughs> TikTok, I mean, TikTok's real, uh, not to harp on this over and over again, but their real trust and safety problem is not disinformation, it's child safety, right? Um, and I don't want to go into the details, but like, it does not take you long to find stuff that you're like, oh, when I DM this person, I know what kind of services they'll be selling, and it's not good. So if um, TikTok's real problem is on the child safety side, but it is a fascinating question on propaganda because they are 100% algorithmic, and they also seem to have no belief in free expression as, as a goal that they should support through any of their decisions. So they should be banned from the United States. Okay. No, I'm not saying that. I, Different reasons. No, I, 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 think, I think what we need is we need, I mean, the United States needs a federal privacy law and the feder it needs to be a federal privacy law that does better than GDPR and that, um, I mean, GDPR has like these structural problems of nobody knows what it means, so it has to get litigated for 10 years. We could have a federal privacy law in the United States that is interpreted by a competent regulator in a way that is much faster and more reasonable than GDPR. And then the other thing we could do is we could be more explicit. GDPR doesn't explicitly say these countries are good and these countries are bad. And I think we're kind of at that, at that part of the world where we have to uh, establish a most favored nation status for certain democracies where American private data can be, can be processed and certain places that it can't be. And then a big chunk in the middle where we incentivize the countries in the middle. Again, India would probably be the most important there to move towards a direction of data protection for American citizens in a way that we, we respect. Um, unfortunately, like and this is all tied up in this crazy stuff that's going on in Europe around the ECG and stuff where Europe, there's a bunch of European privacy advocates for the worst thing in the world is online advertising, um, and then they just completely ignore that the Chinese Communist Party is sitting on the data of, of you know, 400 million Europeans or whatever, and they just kind of ignore that part. So I think the US could lead a lot better here about being explicit about these are democracies, for which there are legitimate arguments about online advertising, but that is a very different argument than allowing autocracies to sit on exabytes of, of American and European user data. Well, I just wanted to say thank you to our panel and for all of you for joining us this evening.